Well, on November of 1963, I was eight and a half years old. I remember staying up late the, on the Thursday night, the 21st, with, and looking with my brother's telescope down. We lived off a of shady, off of Indian Creek Drive, and we could see cars well. And, and I remember with my brother's telescope, we could see the presidential seal. And my dad said, "Get in the car. Come on, we're going to go see the motorcade go by." And I said, well, we're not dressed. It was about 11, after 11 o'clock. And he said, that's okay, just grab a robe and jump in the car. We jumped in my dad's Oldsmobile and we drove down to where Westover Road co comes out of um, uh, Roaring Springs Road. And we sat there and we saw the whole motorcade go by. Well, the next morning, my brother Bob, who's the reason I was even there, he was 11, he woke my dad up and said, we, you promised to take us to see the pre President Kennedy. And, and he said, and my dad looked out the window, saw it was kind of a drizzly morning and thought, God, he's going to have these two boys in a crowd. He liked Kennedy, but he thought it might be a bit of a hassle. And my brother used the, the two words you never want to, you know, you promised. So he said, get your brother dressed. And uh, we drove down. It was about a 10-minute drive down. And we parked, um, I'd say, about six blocks away. And we walked in. And we became part of a crowd of about four to 5,000 people. We were probably standing around the crowd for about 20 minutes when here comes President Kennedy with Johnson and Connolly and uh, Jim Wright and Senator Yarborough and they got up on what was a, I didn't know it at the time, it was a flatbed truck they'd put bunting on and the presidential seal there and the, and the lectern and, and, and it was amazing to see President Kennedy because God, I had mostly seen him on television in black and white and there he was in living color and I couldn't believe how red his hair was. A navy suit on and he seemed in very good spirits. He made a joke about uh, his wife, not, you know, Jackie, not being there, but of course she, she took a little longer to get ready in the morning, but she looked a lot better. And it was a, just a, a, I remember just a real euphoric crowd. I was, you know, I was a bit young to really understand later the consequences of the event. I couldn't believe he had been killed. I came in off the recess playground. I was going to St. Alice. Catholic school off of Camp Bowie and I remember the nuns were all crying and they told us to put our heads down on the desks and then and the news came through on the radio that he had died and uh, you see after that happened everyone in the North Texas area wanted to pretend like it had never happened it was such a dark stain on this local communities and uh, everyone and you, nobody would talk about it uh, if you went through by, if you happened to go by Dealey Plaza and saw people walking around gawking, they were, you could bet your last nickel, they were not from North Texas. And, it, and I think this event tonight, in a way, is, is, is kind of long overdue. Not just to remember, but we, we forget what a great trip they had up until it all went wrong. Yeah, they, uh, they were, you know, Jackie, this was the first trip, the first lady had, uh, taken with him since they had lost their baby in the summer and and they were really you know, they'd had a great day before in San Antonio and Houston and the crowds in Fort Worth and even the crowds in Dallas for that matter you know they were really kind of amazed all the people that had come out to to wish them well so uh, I think there's still a healing going on I think it's been such a, a point of humiliation for the area uh, that uh, I think it's long overdue, and I think it's 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 to be remembered that the trip was a great trip until they got to Dealey Plaza. And can you tell us something about Parkland? Oh, Parkland is a, is a movie that started out as a mini series, an eight hour mini series uh, that I I was I was in Dallas at the film festival about six years ago. I had never been to the Sixth Floor Museum. At that time it was about 20 years old. And I decided to go over there. I was staying at the W Hotel, which is that west side of Dallas. It's kind of built up now. And I had always wanted to go over there. I'd been by Dealey Plaza many times as a boy growing up. And I put on a baseball cap and I went over there and I went through it. And the first thing I saw was a, was a still from um, from the, the speech in Fort Worth in the parking lot of the Hotel Texas. And the next day I called, uh, I called the curator, Gary Mack, and I got him on the phone. He knew who I was. I said, I was in that crowd. I said, do you have any pictures from the front? 
and he he didn't you know he was he was kind of conjoling me a bit and then later that afternoon they called me and said we found some images and it was from a newsreel 16 millimeter newsreel I forget the man who shot it a guy named Cooper I believe and uh, you can see me in a couple of moments there cuts uh, from the president to the crowd and it kind of gave me an idea I thought has anybody ever told this from a human interest story it seemed like it was always you know any kind of dramatization of the event was always uh, kind of uh, you know done in it with a conspiracy angle like like Oliver Stone's movie and a lot of others I remember the first one I think was called executive action or something like that and I thought has anybody ever told this story just from a human interest point of view these people w woke up that day nobody knew the world was about to change this catastrophe was about to happen and if you just follow there's so much that's known about what happened we thought it would be a great idea so I, I found out that uh, Vincent Bugliosi had a book and uh, uh, Stephen Fagan at the Sixth Floor Museum told me that they had an advanced copy of part of the book which he lent me to read. The book was coming out in about four months. I guess this was 2007 and I read this thing and I, I called up Tom Hanks's office. I said I gotta see Tom. I knew Tom from Apollo 13 and his company produced Big Love and we've been friends since we did Apollo and and uh, and he was I got a call from his assistant said he's down he's gonna be at the ball game tonight at Dodger Stadium and wants you to come down and join him tell him what this thing's all about so I went down there and I sat in his box with him and uh, I told him I said you know your company has made uh, kind of a reputation doing many long-form dramas of American history I said I think I have your next miniseries is telling the story of the assassination in Dallas and to correspond it with the 50th anniversary that's coming up. And so he called up HBO and said, I've got my next, my next miniseries for you. And so they paid, we got the book, the Bugliosi book, we got the rights to that, and we had a meeting with Bugliosi, an interesting, very interesting man. I mean, that book's, refer his references have references in, the, in that book. It's a, a cellular analysis of the event. And uh, we hired Peter Landisman, who would ultimately direct the movie as well, uh, to write it as an eight-hour miniseries. Um, when HBO decided not to go forward with it, after several years of putting it together, we were all greatly disappointed. And, uh, but Playtone was not able to be involved at that point, and that's when I kind of, uh, I was not involved in the production of Parkland. So I came up with the idea and the inception of it, and I developed it as a miniseries, but I'm not involved with it as a movie. I'm a producer on it, but it's because I, I got it all going. But I, I wish it well. It's, 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 they've tr it's tried to compress a lot of story, but I think the stories that come across in it is um, Paul Giamatti as, as uh, Abraham Zabruder. That's a quite a poignant story. And uh, Forrest Sorrells, who was the Dallas uh, head of the uh, Secret Service, played by Billy Bob Thornton. Uh, Marcy Gay Harden plays Nurse Nelson, who's the head nurse of the, of the ER. Um, Ron Livingston plays James Hostie. The poor guy was tracking Oswald, but it, it, he didn't have the file. He actually arrived from, from New Orleans that morning. And, uh, and I tell you, the most poignant performance in the movie is, is, is given by an actor named James Badge Dale, who plays Robert Oswald, who had a jailhouse conversation with his brother, and, the next, and two days later he was trying to find somebody to say some words over his body. Nobody would, nobody, no, no, no ministers would come and say words, so he finally found a retired minister to come out. And Hugh Ainsworth, who's here tonight, I got to know Hugh uh, when we were researching the miniseries, and he um, he told me he was one of the pallbearers. You know, they they didn't even have pallbearers, so they asked the the newsman, "Would you help us, you know, bury him here?" But I always thought Robert Oswald's story was a poignant one, and uh, he was a you know he was a stand-up guy. He'd been a Marine. He was, um, he was I think he was working for Acme Brick at the time in Denton, and I and I believe he's still alive. I've never had the. I've never been able to meet him, or had the pleasure. And so you were eight. Your brother was eleven. And what, what your dad's name? My dad's name was John Paxton, and uh, I li I grew up in Florida because there was a family lumber business here. It, came, it started in Kansas City. It was called the Frank Paxton Lumber Company. They were wholesalers of hardwoods, and they were off of Bryan Avenue, not far from here, off of Barry. 
and uh, it was it was started it was it was set up here it was out of Kansas City and a few other cities but it was um, it started in Fort Worth in 1935 because my grandfather was sitting in his study in Kansas City right night reading the Saturday Evening Post and he'd been considering putting a yard in Dallas but he read a, 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 a profile about a flamboyant Fort Worth man named Eamon Carter he decided he'd put the lumber yard in Fort Worth, and that's why I'm even here right now. It's so funny how you kind of go, God, it's so capricious how we're, we all end up in this world.